from your perspective, Peter, I know you have quite a bespoke and very targeted practice. You know, what are the things that we should be looking out for? What are the things that we can all start looking at in ourselves to make sure that we're not waiting until these diseases have set in and we've got advanced end stage disease? You know, what are, what are these key things that maybe we're walking around with, but we're not aware of them? Well, it certainly varies by disease, but let's take the clearest uh, example of where prevention is unmistakably able to get us to the point where we would be far more likely to die with a disease rather than from it. And that's the ultimate goal, right? So, you know, I'm sure you've shared this with many of your male patients. I mean, any man who lives long enough will die with prostate cancer, but some will die from it right? But most men do not die from it, they die with it. And so the, the most broad example of that from a disease perspective is atherosclerosis. Um, everybody has it to some extent. The goal is to not die as a result of it, not to die of a major adverse cardiac event, a heart attack, a stroke. So what would be required to delay the onset of atherosclerosis? Something that I argue is probably somewhat inevitable to our species. Um, well, again, this is where understanding your opponent matters. Now, heart disease, it turns out atherosclerosis, we have a great understanding of its pathogenesis. And we know that while genes play a significant role, those genes play a significant role often through the modification of the following pathways, lipid related pathways, blood pressure related pathways, endothelial dysfunction related pathways. So what are the big risks for heart disease? smoking, high blood pressure, elevated ApoB, and metabolic disorders. So the most extreme example being type 2 diabetes, but <clears throat> again, any dysregulation of glucose and insulin is going to be amplifying the risk of type 2 diabetes, uh, pardon me, of cardiovascular disease. So how can we take that information and act on it so that we delay its onset by two decades? Well, this comes down to how you view the world through the lens of prevention. So I can't speak to how it's done in the UK, but I can tell you that in the United States, we tend to view things through a time horizon of about five to 10 years. So we use risk calculators. Yeah. The risk calculators incorporate information such as your family history, whether you smoke or not, what your lipids look like, your blood pressure, things of that nature. Sometimes they even incorporate information such as a calcium score and they spit out probabilities. They say the probability of you having a major adverse cardiac event, so heart attack, stroke, death, in the next five years or in the next 10 years is X percent. And the consensus view here in the United States is you do not need to treat a patient for primary prevention unless that number is above some threshold, typically 5%. So if you're talking to a 39-year-old patient, by definition, it is mathematically impossible for them to have a five or 10 year risk above 5%. In fact, most of the risk models don't even yeah. allow a calculation if age is below 40. In my case, that was the case. I first began to pay attention to this 15 years ago when I was 35 and there were no risk models. So Basically, no one would consider having treated me preventatively, even though my family history was significant. I even had a speck of calcium on my calcium score, which is a, a, a symbol of late atherosclerosis. Um, my view is that that's completely backwards logic. It's backwards for two reasons. The first is the time horizon is completely wrong. Yes, it's true that if someone's 10-year risk is high, we need to act dramatically. But to wait until a person's 10-year risk is high is tantamount to driving a car towards the edge of the cliff and telling the driver, you're only allowed to hit the brakes when you actually see the edge of the cliff. Yeah. As opposed to telling the driver, I can't quite see the edge of the cliff now, but I know that there is an edge there. Let's slow the car down. But the second reason to me is even more frustrating. And, and I think if I'm going to be critical of the medical establishment in one regard, it's going to be this, which is <clears throat> there's often a failure to appreciate the implication of causality. 
And causality is a, is a complicated topic because it's so often confounded with correlation and association. But I'll spare the listener kind of all of the details because I write about it at some length. But there is no ambiguity about the causality of ApoB and its effect on atherosclerosis. I don't know how much your listeners are familiar with ApoB and if it's worth explaining what that is. But Yeah, Peter, I was going to ask you, so please do expand because it's also not a test that the NHS offer people in the UK either. So not only is it, I know very well, a very powerful, if not the most powerful predictor, but at the same time, it's something that people, unless they pay privately here, which is a very different mm -hmm. model, really don't have access to. So yeah, please do, please do explain. Okay. Well, the good news is, first of all, it's a very inexpensive test, even in, you know, even in the United States with our grossly and disgustingly elevated costs that are artificially inflated. Even in the United States, the ApoB test is only on the order of about 20, somewhere between 12 and $25. So I would imagine that in the UK, even if one were to pay out of pocket, we're talking about a test that probably would cost less than, you know, 10 pounds. Um, but putting that aside for a moment, um, a poor man's substitute for ApoB, which I assume the NHS would cover, would be non-HDL cholesterol. Yeah. Um, is that something that yeah. would be readily available to anybody? Yeah. Okay. Anyone, so, pretty much. so non-HDL cholesterol is a poor man's surrogate for ApoB, but what ApoB is is a, it's a protein that's wrapped around all of the particles that cause atherosclerosis, of which the most common is the low density lipoprotein or LDL. And by measuring the ApoB concentration, you are directly measuring the concentration, i.e. the number of particles per unit volume of all the lipoproteins, the LDLs, the VLDLs, IDLs, LP little a's that cause atherosclerosis. And that turns out to be the most powerful predictor of any lipid or lipoprotein as it pertains to cardiovascular disease. And what you want is for that number to be as low as possible. In formal logic, we would describe ApoB as necessary but not sufficient for atherosclerosis. So you need it to get atherosclerosis. But by itself, it's not sufficient to cause atherosclerosis, which means that there are some people walking around with very high levels of ApoB who do not go on to develop atherosclerosis. But you can't get atherosclerosis without it. So we've established through epidemiologic studies, primary prevention studies, meaning the treatment of people who don't yet have cardiovascular disease, secondary prevention studies, the treatment of people with cardiovascular disease, and Mendelian randomization, perhaps the most powerful of them all. We can explain that if people want in a moment, but I don't think it's germane. We've established through all of these different levels of evidence that low-density lipoprotein, or ApoB, is causally related to atherosclerosis. This is so important. Again, I don't think there are many doctors worth their salt that would not acknowledge that. So now the question becomes, why would we not reduce dramatically at an early age the level of this lipoprotein? And I would use an example that I've used before, I think I use it in the book, of smoking. Everybody knows that smoking is causally related to lung cancer, meaning it's not just an association that we see a tenfold higher prevalence of lung cancer in smokers. And by the way, it doesn't mean that every smoker will get lung cancer or every person who has lung cancer was a smoker. Neither of those things are true, but neither of those things diminish the causal relationship between smoking and lung cancer. And because we know that smoking is causally related to lung cancer, we take a very simple preventive strategy, which is we tell people out of the gate, do not smoke. And if you do smoke, stop right away. Can you imagine if we used models to predict the likelihood of people getting lung cancer and waiting until the probability of that event was, you know, 10% and then saying, well, listen, Johnny, your, your risk of lung cancer is now 10%. It's time to stop. Or let's wait until on the chest CT, we see calcified lesions in your lungs that are suspicious for cancer. Now it's time to stop. Of course not. Once you've established causality, you remove the causative agent. And yet we don't take that approach in treating atherosclerosis. 
which is why atherosclerosis is the leading cause of death globally. 19 million people die every year from atherosclerosis. Number two is a distant second, cancer, 11 to 12 million per year. Atherosclerosis not only shouldn't be the leading cause of death, it shouldn't even be in the top 10 based on the tools we have to delay its onset significantly. Yeah, I really appreciate the analogy to smoking. I think it makes it really clear how how backward, short-sighted, frustrating, limited our approach currently is to how we look at these things. What's really interesting is that you mentioned ApoB and it's necessary, but not sufficient in and of itself. Of course, there's all kinds of other things. I'm guessing inflammation, immune dysfunction, all kinds of sort of, of um, ingredients to put into the mix really to combust things up where you actually end up having the atherosclerosis. But you also mentioned you want to um, bring ApoB down as much as possible. The lower, the better. Now, what's interesting about that for me when I hear that is most things in life, I would say there's upsides and there's downsides, right? And often we just look at the upside and we negate or we we fail to take into consideration what is the downside here. So let's say ApoB, um, let's say we've measured it and it's higher than we would want. And let's say the patient is of a reasonably high risk. I guess you would say by definition, having a high ApoB puts them in a risk category of sorts. The question then is, how aggressively do you decide to lower it? What therapeutic intervention do you use to lower it? And then just to add on that, Peter, is we're talking about these four horsemen that end up bringing life to a close early, right? Atherosclerosis, cancer, neurodegenerative disease, and I think poor metabolic health. Right. Is there ever a scenario where you are aggressively attacking one horseman to bring your risk down off of that one that's then inadvertently increasing your risk of one of the other horsemen? Yeah, there is. And I think staying on this example, I think let, let's use two, let's use two examples, right? So um, we know that <clears throat> aggressive use of a class of lipid lowering agents called statins has a small but non-zero risk of increasing insulin resistance in some individuals. In other words, there are some people who, when you put them on a statin, so a dose like resuvastatin, atorvastatin, yeah. things like that, you reduce their ApoB, which is the desired outcome, but you get an undesirable side effect, which is glucose levels and insulin levels go up. And you are pushing them now further towards the risk side of the spectrum on the metabolic health plane. Well, that's a problem, right? Because to your point, if you're, if you're, Solving one problem and creating another, that's a suboptimal solution. So we have to look for optimal solutions. Now, the good news is where we are today, we have so many tools for reducing ApoB that don't come with those side effects. Now, the good news is most people, and it's hard to quantify this, but it seems to be in the neighborhood of about 90 to 94% of people have no measurable, discernible subjective or objective side effects to statins, meaning they don't have muscle pain, they don't experience elevations in transaminases, they don't have insulin sensitivity issues or anything. But let's just say 10% of people do. We have PCSK9 inhibitors, we have ezetimibe, we have bempendoic acid. These are drugs that really don't seem to come with any side effects. Uh, sometimes when I look at the mechanism of action of a statin, I'm surprised the side effects aren't higher. Because, it, because of where it acts in the mm -hmm. inhibition of cholesterol synthesis and how it does so ubiquitously in the body. But when you look at how these other drugs work, and we don't, I think, need to go into the mechanisms of each of those. I do cover that very briefly in yeah. the book. Um, it's intuitive that the mechanism of action of those drugs matches the clinical experience, which is basically virtually nobody has any side effects to these other drugs. They're much cleaner drugs than a statin, if we can use that lingo. So um, yes, 
the goal is to get ApoB as low as possible. We'll talk about how low that is, um, but you have to be able to do that without creating another problem. And I think, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, that was a much harder proposition yeah. than it is today. If you enjoyed that clip from my podcast, here's another powerful clip that is really going to help you with your health and happiness. If you just want to shock the system, then your body gets to reset. Um, and, and one of the, the most popular things to do in the longevity world now is 